Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Against the Grain. I'm your host, Katie Goodwin. Today is a bonus episode for this. There has been so much happening in the world of golf in the past 48 hours. Today, we had some breaking news from the PGA Tour from the commissioner, Jay Monahan, announcing a merge between Live Golf PGA and the DP World Tour. Now, if you've been keeping up with this Live Golf drama, you would know that the PGA Tour and Live Golf, they have not gotten along these past two years. In October of 2021, it was announced that Greg Norman and the Saudi Arabians would be creating this new tour that would essentially rival the PGA Tour and they would bring other players over for a very, very hefty sum. It was rumored that people like Tiger Woods got offers of $800 million, Hideki Matsuyama getting offers that could literally allow him to buy a whole airline, and Phil Mickelson signing a contract for around $200 million, and the list just goes on and on about people getting these absurd amounts of money, and also just where this money is coming from, those rumors that have been surrounding them, the kind of people that these sponsors are, and just all of that around. And before that, you had Jay Monahan saying that he would never go with them, he would never partner with them, they just wanted to be completely separate. You had Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods creating their own golf league that was going to start potentially this year, if not next year. We had schedule changes that were going to come out, and now that has all just been erased. Jay Monahan coming out with a statement saying, quote, the parties have signed an agreement that combines PIF's golf-related commercial businesses and rights, in parentheses including Live Golf, with the commercial businesses and rights of the PGA Tour and DP World Tour into a new collectively owned for-profit entity to ensure that all stakeholders benefit from a model that delivers maximum excitement and competition among the game's best players, end quote. So this statement came out this morning. It was also said that Greg Norman, the CEO of Live Golf, had no idea this was happening until 10 minutes before it was announced. Also, PGA Tours tweeted out their comments about it. Some saying like Colin Morikawa, it was great to find out the news this morning on Twitter. Joel Damon saying that he's always wanted to play on the Four Aces team. He's always looked up to them. People like Dylan Wu saying that it's hypocrisy. You have Wesley Bryan coming out and saying that it's just a disgrace. Whereas you have live golfers like Phil Mickelson, Brooks Kepka, Taylor Gooch saying that they're coming back, it's about time, and when you do look at it, it's it's an absurd situation, it's absolutely crazy. So now they're allowing live tour players to reapply for membership on the PGA Tour. Prior to this, Jay Monahan had banned them from the PGA Tour, basically expelling their memberships, not allowing them to play on those events, but they could play in majors. But now they're going to be allowed to come back and play in every event. It is rumored that they will have to pay a pretty hefty fine depending on how much their contract was, but no one really knows the exact details of that. And so now these players are coming back with millions and millions of dollars, way more than the PGA top PGA Tour players have all year long and it's almost unfair as to how much money they got the amount of rest they got and now they're just able to come back like nothing ever happened yes they will have to pay a fine but fines happen in sports all the time and people come right back from it and you know they're also merging with the dp world tour and in case you don't know that is the european tour circuit so basically, Jay Monahan is not only going to be commissioner of the PGA Tour, but of all of these tours. And he said that it's to unify the game of men's professional golf and just to apparently grow the game, which 
I personally don't really know how it's going to grow the game. Honestly, for me, this situation has always just been very, very funky in better terms to put it because you just have these people getting absurd, like literally crazy amounts of money to only play in 10 to 14 tournaments a year. Currently, they have 14 tournaments this year on their 2023 schedule. Their next one being in Valderrama, Spain on June 30th, but you just have them playing less events, getting so much more money, and you don't know necessarily where this money is coming from. And then it's the same for the PGA Tour as well. You don't know where that money is coming from. But then also when you look at it, you know, the women are not getting as much money as these men. And granted, their money is also coming from some suspicious places, but they have nothing like this. You know, in the previous episode, we said that the men are getting purses of $20 million. They're getting, if they win the season and event, they get $20 million. And it's just crazy how much money they're getting, how much focus they're putting into the men, whereas the women are just getting overshadowed. You had former professional women's players coming out saying that they didn't know if the LPGA could survive if live golf and the pga kept going like this throwing these amounts of money at the tour when the women just kept getting overshadowed and they still don't get a lot and that's the crazy part to me i just think that some of this money could go towards better things and it's just crazy so it'll be really interesting to see how this whole situation plays out Personally, I don't know if I can support the PGA Tour um, just through this because of what has happened. It's just, it's an act of hypocrisy, if I'm being honest, because you have this person who's a public figure in the golf world saying that he doesn't support it and players coming alongside him saying that we want to take a stand against what's happening and not just any players, players like Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods, not just people out, you know, people that people recognize. And, you know, it's just, it's, he's basically turned his back on the PGA Tour and to stand up there when no one had no idea. And it wasn't just PGA Tour players that had no idea, it was also the Live Tour players. I had a, Instagram message from someone that said they were sitting next to Brendan Steele, who was a live player, and he had no idea any of this was going to happen. So everyone was just completely blindsided. And so like I said, it'll be crazy to see what happens and how everything plays out. I hope that the BGA really does take a deeper look at this and just really evaluate the best decision for them and for their future. So that was all of our live golf PGA, all that drama. It seems like it just never ends and it just keeps getting crazier in golf. Like I said, it's been a crazy 48 hours. So then you look at the women's side and you look at Rose saying, she is doing some incredible things in the women's golf world. So in a couple of weeks ago, she won the individual title at the NCAA Women's Golf Championships at Greyhawk Golf Club in Scottsdale. She was 10 under at two with a score of 278. And this year she had eight wins, eight wins in her college, in her year. And that tied the most in history. And she was also back to back national championship national champion the first to ever do this in men's or women's and so then she turned pro right after that and everyone was kind of like what's rose roseanne gonna do how is she gonna finish and so it was the mizuno lpga classic and it was actually sponsored by former stanford player michelle wee stanford being the college that Rose Lang attended. 
And so she opened with a two under round at that tournament. And, you know, you could never count her out because of what she has done in the past. And at the end of the four days, she was nine under, but unfortunately a bogey on her last hole landed her in a tie with former Wake Forest player, Jennifer Cupcho. And Rose ended up parring the second playoff hole to win in her LPGA pro debut. And she became the first player to win in her pro debut in 72 years since Beverly Hansen won the Eastern Open in a playoff over Babe Zaharias back in 1951. And it's just truly incredible when you look at what Rose Zhang is doing now. And granted, she was a, an amazing player at the amateur level. She was ranked number one for over 150 weeks, setting the record there and she had so many wins at Stanford, not an easy place to win at, or easy conference to win at, I should say. And just seeing her go back to back in national championships, what she had done in USGA championships, and now she's able to transfer that over into LPGA golf. That's truly, truly spectacular. And I think what she's doing for golf is gonna be incredible. And she's so young, she has so many years ahead of her. She's going to join the ranks of people like Nellie Corda, Michelle Wee, just women who have done amazing things, not only in American golf, but world golf, global golf. And she's going to, she is an inspiration to not only myself, but to so many young women golfers. And so it'll be exciting to see what she's able to do and just to cheer her on as a former college golfer and fan of women's golf. So then we get to the PGA Tour, just normal tournament golf in the PGA Tour. Um, this past weekend event was the Memorial, Class Memorial Classic, um, obviously hosted by the one and only Jack Nicholas. And so the victor of that tournament was Victor Hovland in a playoff over Denny McCarthy. And I actually have a super funny story with Denny. Back in 2015, I was attending a Corn Ferry event in Oregon and his caddy actually handed my mom and I water. So shout out to Denny's caddy at that time, but really great guy. Um, but they ended up in a tie at the end of the rounds and went into a playoff and Victor ended up winning that playoff and had his fourth PGA career victory and it was actually his only victory on American soil. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And he's actually been super close to winning all year, including a second place finish at the PGA championship and another six top tens on the year. So it was only a matter of time before he won. And the crazy thing is the day after he won, he showed up to caddy for his former teammate from Oklahoma State. They were roommates back in Oklahoma, Zach Bosho at the Columbus US Open qualifier. Unfortunately, Zach did not make it to the US Open, but props to having Victor on the bag and having him show up. So then that leads me into US Open qualifying, also known as the longest day in golf. It is where nine sites host hundreds of golfers all vying for spots to compete in the US Open, which is going to be held next week at the Los Angeles Country Club, which sneak peek, I will be there on Friday. So be on the lookout for some TikTok content that will be coming out from that. And I might just do a recap of my experience in the tournament on Spotify for the podcast. So again, be on the lookout for that. So like I said, there were nine qualifying sites for this longest day in golf. And a lot of people who weren't expected to made it. And it's really cool to see some of the stories that have come out from this. And so our first qualifier is the Tacoma, Washington qualifier. This one hits close to home being from Oregon Pacific Northwest. I actually had someone, a couple of people that played in Oregon Junior Golf that I knew of that were playing in this one, such as Spencer Tibbetts, who I would always see around at junior golf events. So always cheering him on, but unfortunately he failed to qualify. 
Um, and then you go on to the Toronto qualifier. Again, some people actually kind of shocked me that failed to qualify, such as Ludwig Abberg, um, Maverick McNeely, Jimmy Walker, who was actually super close. Um, Ryan Gerard was the winner of that one at 11 under. Forgot to mention Jesse Shu at three under won the Tacoma qualifier. So then you get to Hillcrest Country Club in Los Angeles. That one was won by Omar Morales at 10 under par. And Preston Summerhays, an uh, ASU player, forks up, also made the US Open in a playoff, a two for three. So that was really good. And his sister, Grace Summerhays, also qualified for the US Women's Open. So that's really exciting for their family. And then you get to a Florida qualifier. You have Austin Truslow winning that one at five under par. You get into your Georgia qualifier, Gordon Sargent, who as a standout at Vanderbilt, ended up qualifying at 13 under par, which was, I believe, the lowest score at all of the qualifiers. So that was really incredible what he's doing, um, just so young in his college career. And in our Maryland qualifier, Carl Phillips, a Stanford Cardinal, ended up qualifying. And then New Jersey fellow Stanford Cardinal, Michael Thorby Ornson qualified at eight under par. So I guess Michael can't have Carl on the bag for this tournament. He'll have to find somebody else. And our Columbus qualifier where Victor Hovland was caddying for Zappo show was Owen Brown Jr. qualifying at 11 under par and 10 other people qualifying are oh and also to mention in that columbus qualifier dylan Wu, um um oh wait nope okay that's in their springfield qualifier i was getting ahead of myself but dylan Wu actually made it and i did play junior golf with his sister growing up so i just think that's really interesting just like a little connection there but you know fellow oregonian and then last qualifier of the day was the North Carolina qualifier and Yuto Katsurogawa at 12 under par winning that one to send him to the US Open with three others. So I just think it's really interesting to always look back at who qualifies and the stories that come out of it. Some of them are really truly incredible. And I feel like just having the qualifying for the US Open like this gives people a chance to, you know, put their game on the spotlight and just show what they're made of and give them an opportunity to participate in the year's toughest test. And it'll be super fun to not only go, but to see how these players perform. So with that, that is all I have for this Kind of, I guess, special episode of Against the Grain. Just like I said, it has been a crazy, crazy couple of days in the golf world. Like literally this morning, I was just reading all the news I can about this live golf PGA Tour drama and what's happening. I feel like things are coming out just every few minutes, new tweets, new posts. And so I'm just trying to keep up with it all. and. Like I said, it'll be interesting to see what happens with everything in these next couple of days, next few months, even how it plays out next year with the schedule changes that are coming. So again, with that, I hope to see you guys on the next episode of Against the Grain. I'm your host, Katie Goodwin. Bye, everyone.